I am back. <laughs> Just gotta make sure I can't like see my screen that well. I'm back, you guys. Hey guys. I'm just gonna wait for everyone to join again. You guys can ask your questions. If I didn't get around to a question, please ask it here. Um, I Sometimes I just take forever to get through questions and I'm like, ah! But yeah, feel free to ask your question here. It's the Brutons! What time is it there? It's like evening. Your teeth are so pearly white. How do you take care of them? Do you oil pull? Yeah, so I just, I always say like, I just take care of my teeth, you guys. Um, I used food grade hydrogen peroxide for a while to um, whiten them up. Like I would just pour it on the brush, my toothbrush, and just brush with them for like a minute before I hopped in the shower and just rinsed out my mouth. And then, yeah, I just oil pull I co uh, with coconut oil every single morning. And then just like, I take care of my teeth. I floss them, I brush them, I rinse after eating. Like I just, um, my parents were really good about when I was a kid, like making sure I took care of my teeth and then I just carried that on throughout my life. So I just take really good care of my teeth, but nothing special. Like I don't get them professionally whitened or anything like that. How do you know you found the root cause of your PCOS? Um, it's not necessarily like knowing if you found a root cause. There's usually many root causes. It's just more of like you need to get to the bottom and a, a lot of times healing comes in layers. So, you know, it takes you looking at your symptoms and really figuring out where they're coming from. Like, did they happen since you were born? Did they happen since you were five years old and you had a really traumatic event? Like, you have to really start to dig a little deeper and make a timeline of where your health started to go downhill, what were maybe the factors before that, how your diet was as a child, were you breastfed, were you bottle fed, were you vaginally born, were you cesarean born? All those things will drive more stress in the body and then you have to kind of like so let for example if you were a c-section baby and you were bottle fed your gut is probably was probably struggling from the very beginning because you didn't get all that uh, beneficial bacteria uh when you pass when you would pass through the vaginal canal and then you weren't um, given the colostrum or the beneficial bacteria that comes in through the breast milk and so therefore okay your gut was kind of um set up for failure from the beginning. That's not a bad thing necessarily, but it's a good thing to know because now you know you probably have impaired gut function and you're more sensitive. Um, or did your mom have health conditions or stress when you were in the womb? That was probably imprinted onto you. So, you know, you need to go back to the beginning and really start to uncover what's driving this condition. Is it is it more of a stress-based issue? Is it a thyroid-based issue? Is it both? Is it estrogen detoxification? You know, were you chronically constipated growing up? you know and you weren't getting that estrogen out of your body you know there's so many little tiny factors that play a role and that's why I really go through somebody's whole health history because I really want to get to the bottom of why they're not feeling good and not just be like oh yeah PCOS and I think you have insulin resistance let's just change your diet bye you know like no that doesn't actually help someone so it's not you are not going to have one root cause of PCOS you're going to have a death by a thousand cut situation and you have to slowly start removing stressors as you find them when you say like oh wow you know the toxic self tanner I've been putting on every single night is burdening my liver maybe I should stop doing that you take that one cut off then you're like wow I'm gonna change my lotion now take that one cut off oh I'm gonna stop using Windex and you know destroying my lungs okay cool take that one cut off it's it's there's many causes, you guys, and these things are death by a thousand cuts. It's more about how can I remove stress from my body and how can I add benefit to it, make it more resilient to stress. That's really where the answer is. Love your strategy on binge eating makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I personally struggled from binge eating and, you know, a lot of people were saying like, oh, it's an eating disorder, it's an eating disorder, and I get it does have a mental component for sure, but I, I think the mental component of it was that I had restricted food for so long for myself that I was just so, like, it's like one of those things where you like tell yourself you can't have something, right, and you just want it more. Like, of course, like, when you tell yourself you're not allowed to eat a certain amount over a certain amount, you immediately want to because you're just like so fed up. So I think the body really has to override the brain. Uh, do do you know why? Mm, I'm not sure. Lydia, can you ask your question again, Lydia? Because um, you just said, do you know why? And I'm not really sure. Oh, it's 7 p.m. 
in Europe. Is there a good calcium supplement? I recommend eggshell calcium. Um, it can be really hard on the stomach. Like calcium can be really hard on the stomach in general. So that's why I really recommend you getting it from the food. Um, it's really good to keep your supplements very conservative, you guys. Once you start popping all these individual nutrients, you don't really know if your body's actually breaking them down and absorbing them like they would the actual foods. The best thing you can do is get your calcium from your food. Um, if you can't for whatever reason, I the next best thing is making your own egg shell calcium powder so you would just take your eggshells make sure before you crack your eggs you just wash the outsides really good you want to use high quality eggs like pasture raised eggs you don't want to be using like grocery store eggs and um you would wash the outsides really good then you would crack the egg and then you just set it on a paper towel to dry out then i just usually will set them in the sun to get completely dried out completely dry and then you just put them in a coffee grinder and grind them up into a powder and you can just add you know a small amount to uh, your smoothies or just take it in mixed in orange juice or whatever how is SIBO treated starve the bacteria is any carbs okay to eat because i have low morning cortisol and i get stressed with no carbs yeah, the biggest mistake people make when they have SIBO is to stop eating carbs. Like, stop doing that, please. Um, SIBO is not a gut problem. I mean, it is in the gut, but it's not a gut problem. It's a metabolism problem. So when things are slowly moving through your digestive tract, you will always have rotting and fermenting taking place in the small intestine where it doesn't belong. Because... Anything that's just sitting there is going to rot and ferment. And so you need to move motility along. You need to get eating things that are going to move motility along and not uh, not really slow motility. One of the biggest things that slows motility is like leafy green vegetables and things like that, like bulky fibrous vegetables. You have no you have no ability to break those down right now and do not need to be eating them. Um, so it's best to, that's why like low FODMAP diets don't include those kinds of foods like, um, like uh, kale and uh, romaine and things like that because it's just like you're not a cow like you don't have three stomachs to digest foods like that and you're not a ruminant am animal so um, the first thing is really removing those super fibrous foods that are just really slowing digestion down and this is not like popular opinion you guys but I have a lot of people that have come to me doing all of the popular SIBO diets and they're not getting anywhere and so that's why I always recommend doing mostly ripe fruits because they're pretty easy to break down and digest, specifically tropical fruits like papaya and mango and pineapple. Um, but it's really about you finding what you tolerate well and what's getting your digestive system to move quickly. It's not as much about following whatever, you know, this specific SIBO diet says or this specific SIBO diet says. It's, it's not about that at all. It's about really finding what is tolerable to you and then also getting your digestive system moving as quickly as possible, which is usually the restriction of like those fibrous foods and really focusing on starchy foods. Um, and I really like if you can tolerate dairy, I like it. But uh, sometimes you can only tolerate like broths and collagen and gelatin and some meats and that's okay. It's really finding what you can tolerate and then making sure you're focusing so much on metabolically enhancing foods, meaning that they're easy to digest, break down and absorb and will quickly, quickly move through your digestive tract very quickly because speeding up your metabolism is the root cause of healing your SIBO. That's how you're going to heal your SIBO is you're getting your metabolism functioning because thyroid is needed to make hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes, which is going to affect what actually gets into the small intestine. And then thyroid is also going to affect how quickly those things move through. And then the amount of stress levels you have on your body, your cortisol or your adrenals, uh, is going to affect your digestion as well. And so in my opinion, SIBO is not a, a gut problem and should not just be focused on. It needs to be a whole body issue. It's a, it's a metabolic issue. You always have to ask yourself, why did um, bacteria grow in the small intestine in the first place? And a lot of times it was because of low stomach acid, low digestive enzyme function, and then just slow motility overall. So what do you have to do? You have to speed up motility by eating foods that will quickly move through the digestive tract. You need to make sure that you are um, lowering stress and supporting the thyroid so that you can make digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid, and then you need to make sure that um, you are overall just supporting your body. So I, I really don't think that SIBO should just be focused on. I think that you should first focus on metabolically enhancing foods and get foods out that are making things slowly 
uh, go through the gut and then you can start to implement antibacterials or natural antibiotics or even um, like Zyfaxin is an antibiotic that's used by doctors for small intestinal bacteria overgrowth that stays in the intestine. It doesn't always work, but it can sometimes work for people. And then um, you got to work on the migrating motor complex, which I use um, certain things called prokinetics for that. And then uh, you also want to do intestinal massage to get the ileocecal valve closed. So you have this valve in between the small intestine and large intestine that is a one-way valve. It's supposed to only open up to let food out of the small intestine into the large intestine. But when you're chronically constipated, this valve gets stuck open, poops starts to build up and then it gets into the small intestine and a lot of time you have this like fecal matter built up um blocking the valve from actually closing which is gross but true and so you've got to actually work on massaging the ileocecal valve to get it closed with small intestinal bacteria overgrowth so honestly it's a, it's a complex issue it needs to be done in a strategic order it's not just something that you can like google and be like oh i have small intestinal bacteria overgrowth let me follow this protocol i found on this one blog What's your recommendation for dealing with candida? I have symptoms after taking antibiotics and I have PCOS. Um, my recommendation is to just keep going along with your life and treat yourself well. Do not go on a candida diet. That is the worst thing ever. Like I always find that people that go on candida diets, they like see their symptoms improve for a while. And But what you have to understand is when you want your yeast to stay in the digestive tract. You don't want it to become angry and you don't want it to become hungry because once it becomes hungry, like pe the, the biggest thing that people think is that candida is easy to kill. You just starve it and then it goes away. No, that's not what happens. When you starve it, it gets mad, it gets hungry. And so they ha candida has these long fingers that can start to go through the gut walls into the bloodstream and actually become a systemic issue. That's why we get uh, the yeast gets in our vaginas and that's why the yeast gets in our sinuses and uh, starts to plug up our sinuses. Um, that's why it can get into our lungs and our skin because it can become a systemic issue when you make it angry and you starve it. So I, that's why I personally don't recommend starving candida. I don't recommend cutting all carbs and all sugars to kill yeast because it doesn't actually kill it, it makes it mad. Um, I recommend lowering your intake, but at the same time taking antifungals. And sometimes like if you can get it uh, from your doctor, like a diflucan can be helpful, but, um, or uh, what's it, nice statin can be helpful. But a lot of times doctors won't give you antifungals unless it come, candida comes up on your blood. And unfortunately, if it's in your blood, it's 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 pretty rampant. So I like undisalinic acid by Thorn. I like oregano, any kind of oregano oil. Grapefruit seed extract is wonderful. You can make your own clove pills. You just I just grind up ground cloves in the coffee grinder and put them into capsules, or you can buy it, whatever. Um, and Ceylon cinnamon is also wonderful for clearing candida. So um, I recommend eating a really good nutrient dense diet that's low in chemicals. Um, don't like restrict anything, don't restrict carbs, don't restrict, just eat how you normally eat, eat balanced meals, protein, carb, and fat. Really support your metabolism because you have to understand that a healthy immune system and a healthy body would be able to fight yeast. It wouldn't let an overgrowth of yeast occur. When you have, when yeast um, sees that it's an opportun it's an opportunistic organism. So when it sees that it can actually grow in a host, it will absolutely grow in a host, but um, it shouldn't. And so that is why you have to ask yourself, why was this allowed in the first place? Were you really stressed out? Was it during a time when you maybe like weren't eating really well or, you know, weren't sleeping really well? And then, you know, so now you have to actually like make an environment for healing, start to, uh, you know, if you're eating a healthy diet, then you would actually want to go on and actually continue with some antifungal herbs and things like that. Best progesterone supplements? Um, over the counter, if you can't get one prescribed by your doctor, like a bioidentical uh, compounded progesterone. The only ones available are usually creams and Smoky Mountain Naturals and Emerita, which are both on Amazon, are pretty good brands. You can also get one called Progest E, which is an under the tongue dropper. Um, and it's on, you Google it, just Google Progest E. I can't remember the website that it's on, but it's sold by some more like small business uh, supplement stores. They seem kind of shady, but they're not. How should a vegetarian overcome PCOS? Should we have to eat every two hours for PCOS? Yeah, it's very hard um, to overcome PCOS 
when you're a vegetarian just because there's not enough protein rich foods available to you unless you're just consuming lots of dairy and eggs um, because uh, remember that a lot of plant foods are first of all really hard to digest for us a lot of them contain something called anti-nutrients so like beans and and grains for example eating those in high amounts actually don't just make it very difficult for your uh, your digestive system to break down but they actually absorb nutrients in the digestive tract they actually bind to them in the digestive tract um, so it can be uh, very tricky and I, I personally believe that vegetarianism and veganism and PCOS is just contraindicated. It's so difficult. Like I personally uh, have a very hard time working with people that want to heal from PCOS and are vegetarians because I just have to, I come to a point where I'm like, if you they, they almost always come to a point where they're like, I'm not seeing my symptoms really improve. And I'm saying like, I know I've done all I can. We've gotten to a point where it's eat meat or stay where you're at. And unfortunately, that's just the case. That's just how it is. So um, I try to cater, but at the same time, like you need protein, you need gelatinous, uh, collagenous foods. You need those nutrient dense foods to heal. It would be one thing if you were a healthy person and you're just like, um, you know, you're just trying to maintain and that's fine. But when you're actually, you're, you're trying to promote cellular healing on a cellular level, your body doesn't just need like recommended daily allowance of nutrients. Your body needs a flood of nutrients. So it has all the things it needs to, to rebuild itself. Can you imagine? So I want you to think of it like this. And this is what I tell vegetarians and vegans. If you are building your dream house, right? You're building this dream house mansion that you're like, I want to just go all out. Would you be like, I just need, you know, like you just want just small amounts of materials, but somebody just gave you the smallest amount of materials to build your mansion with. And you're like, well, wait, I don't have everything that I need to build the mansion that I want to build. And they're like, well, that's all you get. That's all you can use. And you're like, okay. And you start building your mansion and you're like, oh, I got to make a little, um, a, this a little smaller over here. And I got to like make this cubby over here because you don't have all the materials you need. As opposed to if you were building your dream house or you're building your dream mansion and somebody just said, you have all these materials, you have unlimited materials, you go ahead and build whatever you need. You're going to go crazy, right? You're going to build the baddest, awesomest house on the planet. And that's just a bad analogy. But what I'm saying is that if you're trying to rebuild something that's very important, like your body, would you want a limited amount of nutrients from a limited pool? Or would you want a flood of nutrients? And that's what you need to see um, certain foods as and specifically animal foods are very, very nutrient dense plant foods are very difficult to break down. Have you ever had someone with hyperhidrosis and found a cause or a cure when they've had it all their life? I think hyperhidrosis is where you sweat a lot, right? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times sweat is really due to um, uh, stress hormones, just prolactin, adrenaline, um, cortisol, just like excessive sweating is, is your body not being able to really regulate uh, the, the hydration in, in the cells. I think hyperhidrosis is that, I can't remember. Is it possible to heal the vagus nerve? Lost gag reflex and it feels like the more I feel relaxed and stimulate the vagus nerve, the opposite happens in the body, higher stress response. Yeah, sometimes the body will actually numb the vagal tone because neurotransmitters are so messed up in the gut. Remember that gut-brain connection. So for people that are listening, the vagus nerve is the nerve that runs all the way from our brain down to our gut. It's the nerve that connects the gut and the brain. And um, vagal tone is necessary for digestive enzyme production. Um, your gag reflex, um, uh, vocal cords uh, can get weak or strong based on the vagus nerve. Um, so that's why people that have really severe gut issues can lose their singing voices sometimes. Um, so vagal tone is really necessary to keep that gut and brain connected and just to keep digestive functioning well and then central nervous system good. But when you have the central nervous response in, in that um, sympathetic state, meaning we're in fight or flight, sometimes the vagus nerve will actually numb it, it will become more numb, like you, you lose tone 
on purpose. Your body actually doesn't want the gut sending all those signals to the brain because the gut's so dysfunctional that the neurotransmitters there are actually affecting the brain and, and the body. And so I think that sometimes losing vagal tone is the body's way of protecting itself from, from the disaster that's happening in the gut. I see people that the more the severe, the more severe the gut issues are, the more severe your vagal tone um, loss is. And so I don't think you should try to to restore vagal tone until you actually heal your gut. I think that sometimes the numbing of the vagus nerve is the body's um, response to gut issues, not like something that needs to be healed until you actually have gotten yourself out of fight or flight, you've gotten your gut in a healthy place, then it's time to actually restore that connection between the gut and the brain. But you don't want to be restoring connection between the gut and the brain when what's going on in the gut is going to stress out the brain. I hope that makes sense. What's the best approach for ridding H. pylori? Yeah, so ridding H. pylori, it really depends on the virulence factors. Like when you get a gut test, like a comprehensive stool analysis, it won't just tell you if you have H. pylori or not. It'll tell you how much you have, and it'll tell you if you have virulence factors, like certain factors which make the H. pylori worse or better, just depending on what type it is. And so... It is important to get a comprehensive stool analysis so you understand how much there is rather than just I have positive H. pylori or negative H. pylori because the more you have the more likely it is you had it for a long time and you have to understand like the first 18 months you have H. pylori your stomach acid production is low but then once you have H. pylori for longer than that your stomach acid production is actually high and that's when you can start to actually get like really bad heartburn and stuff so you know you don't want to be adding to hydrochloric acid if your hydrochloric acid production is high and you've had H. pylori for a really long time. Um, but killing H. pylori is actually pretty difficult. It takes um, a whole body approach. Like you want, really want to start to um, kill it slowly with antibacterials. Um, you can use like grapefruit seed extract, um, matula tea, uh, mastic gum, uh, ginger, um, oregano, uh, berberine, like all those just regular herbal antibacterials. Uh, there's one, there's actually a, a supplement called pylorosil that works pretty well, um, but it just takes time. I actually really, my favorite way to uh, get my, because I personally have struggled with H. pylori, um, and it was a battle to kill. Like, I had to go through a battle, and I tried everything, like mastic gum, um, so many different things, which barely touched it, but then I decided, I came across a supplement called sodium acetate, and I was like, I don't know if I want to buy sodium acetate, but I did read some studies that said that H. pylori would be killed by sodium acetate. So I was like, okay, let me make some sodium acetate because I know like basic chemistry and I know that you can just mix sodium bicarbonate or baking soda with vinegar or apple cider vinegar and make sodium acetate. When those things interact with each other, it becomes sodium acetate. And I would just drink that. So I drank like four to six ounces of water with about a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and about half a teaspoon of baking soda twice a day in between meals. And that, praise Jesus, was the best thing I could do for both H. pylori and SIBO because I had both of them. And so um, it, for whatever reason, it really helped restore my stomach acid production and kill H. pylori. And I was using other things like uh, loracidin, I was using um, mastic gum, and I was using oregano as well. But yeah, it takes a whole body approach. You have to always understand that H. pylori is this corkscrew bacteria that corkscrews into your stomach and uh, makes ammonia. And uh, it, it, feels like it's okay there for a reason, right? Because your stomach acid production is low in the first place. But then once you have H. pylori, it can mess with your stomach acid levels. So it's not, the, the fix is no longer like, oh, I just need to get my stomach acid up, levels back up. It's now I have to kill H. pylori first, then get my stomach acid levels back up so that H. pylori does not come back and feel like it can live in my stomach again. Because H. pylori, once it takes a, a hold, it actually will um, neutralize the stomach acid so that it can live a lot longer. Best way to increase male fertility. Uh, you got to get him uh, uh, from being under stress. You got to get his phone out of his pocket, get those EMFs away from um, that sperm maker. Um, you got to um, 
make sure he's eating healthy and just like anything that enhances female fertility also enhances male fertility so he needs to be eating enough he needs to be eating regularly have a high functioning metabolism he needs to lower his stress um, needs to be sleeping well um, shouldn't be over consuming uh, caffeine like all day long should be drinking enough water getting enough minerals getting enough nutrients same thing for women applies to men as well my first question was my period had stopped again and now my dermatitis on my hand has disappeared is this linked um I'm not really sure that's really interesting I don't know if um yeah I mean dermatitis is usually affected by gut bacteria but you know remember when it comes to your period stopping you have to understand that your period is not the thing that is missing ovulation is missing you need to go back to two weeks before the period was supposed to start and ask yourself what happened then where was the stressor then what is causing you to not ovulate because ovulation is what brings on a period remember the star of the show for your cycle is not that bleed that bleed is a result of an ovulation that occurred the ovulation is the peak of your cycle and I know we're not taught that in school we're not taught that at all we don't even sometimes we go through our half of our life without even knowing that if ovulation happens or not half of us still don't even know if we're ovulating or not which is a problem um, just because there's no bleed doesn't mean it's important not important and so you need to look back as to what's preventing you from ovulating not what's preventing your period what's preventing you from ovulating I do lose weight while eating intuitively um, I do lose I do I lose weight while eating intuitively without going back into a diet mentality um, I'm ask, I'm assuming you're asking how do I lose weight while eating intuitively? Um, so you have to get out of that mindset. Like a lot of women fear that if they're not obsessed with losing weight, they won't lose weight. Like you have to be obsessed and concerned with weight loss in order to lose weight. That's not the case. You can go through your life eating when you're hungry and stopping when you're full and move when you feel like moving and treat your body well and still lose weight without actually being concerned if you're going to lose weight or not. And I need you to understand, you need to ask yourself, if I didn't lose weight, would that change the way I'm treating my body? If that question, the answer to that question is yes, meaning that you would treat your body differently do if you were skinnier or if you were or if you are bigger, then there's a problem there, right? Because you should not be treating your body for a specific expectation. You should be treating your body well because you're worthy of it, you deserve it, and you want to live your life well. You want to live a high quality life full of energy and vitality. And the weight is a non-issue. It will change if you're treating your body right. Your body, a healthy body finds a very, um, a very balanced weight but if we have expectations based on our choices we're going to constantly be, be disappointed i hope that makes sense so you know being obsessed with weight loss doesn't necessarily equal weight loss just like not being concerned with weight loss doesn't mean you won't lose weight I appreciate all your support, Jess. Recognizing I'm using you as my litmus test for my FDN's approach and quickly learning I need to just hop on that wait list. Oh, uh, I know that a lot of, you know, F uh, FDN really taught me so much, but then I've gone on. I've used the foundation that it laid and then I continued my education. And there are a lot of practitioners that maybe just don't have the time to do that or the experience or um, maybe the desire. And so they just kind of stick to a more cookie cutter approach just because that's what they're comfortable with. And you have to understand that that's just sometimes um, what someone feels comfortable with. Or there's a different type of person. I'm a rebel, right? Like I, you know, I always take what I learn and I'm like, I'm going to try to disprove everything everything I learned to make sure that I understand what I've learned is the truth. And so that allows me to really metamorphosize and change. And that's why I'm always changing you guys. I'm always researching. Like I can't stop myself. It's what I do for fun. Like I'm a sicko. And so, um, I, it's just my passion. Like it truly is a passion. And I, see that some people lose the passion or they don't know their passion quite so they've just kind of settled into a job and there's a difference between a job and a passion right but um there's a lot of fdns that are really really good and they're doing the right thing and just because we don't work the same way doesn't mean that they can't get you healthy because they totally can um you know, just because someone doesn't do health the same way that I do it doesn't mean that they don't know what they're doing or there's a million ways to skin a cat pretty much is what I'm trying to say. 
Do you think I can clean up my gut alone or should I get support from you or someone like you? Sometimes you can. Um, you know, I did a lot of gut healing work before I worked with anybody. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that you can do. I'm going to be talking in Fully Nourished, the program I'm coming out with soon, the online program that will be available. I'll be actually announcing a launch date next week. It should be uh, very so fairly soon. Um, I will be walking through a lot of gut healing principles in Fully Nourished. I'm actually going to be creating a whole different gut healing program just because I think it's well deserving of its own program. But Fully Nourished is, is the foundation. It is the foundation for metabolic healing and it will be focusing on foods that increase your ability to metabolize them quickly and get them through the digestive system without driving much inflammation at all. So I will be going over a lot of gut healing principles in Fully Nourished. It won't be a gut healing program, it's a metabolism healing blueprint but it is going to definitely get you started on um, a road towards getting your digestion a lot more healthy and then you know my purpose for the, my next gut program is so once women have gone through fully nourished and they've you know uh, implemented all those things then they can actually dive into gut healing a little bit more in depth but it's really important to make sure that you've gotten your diet shifted first your mindset shifted your exercise shifted all of those factors have changed before you actually uh, dive into a gut healing protocol because it's really not safe to, to heal your gut um, without supporting your thyroid and your adrenal glands. Is there a basal temperature monitor gadget you can recommend? I'm rubbish at remembering to take it first thing, and I'm a mouth breather, so it's not too accurate when I do remember. Uh, yeah, so um, a lot of women, I actually really wanna get a temp drop. A temp drop is like a little wearable armband, and the thermometer is attached to the armband, and it's actually in your armpit all night long. And it seems really comfortable. A lot of women that follow me use it and have recommended it to me. I wanna buy one, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. It's a little on the pricier side, but to me, it's well worth it. It, or there's another one called Ovusense, which is a vaginal um, thermometer. I don't know how I feel about it. Like, I feel re really weird about that. Like, I don't think I would want to wear a, a vaginal thermometer all night, but some women find that it's fine. So those are like the two that I would recommend that are not a um, under the tongue thermometer. Under the tongue is the most uh, accurate, but obviously if you're a mouth breather, then it might not be. And then you would want to just get an oximeter, O-X-I-M-E-T-E-R. You can find one, you know, you've probably been to the doctor and they latch on one of those things on, on the tip of your finger. That's an oximeter. And you can usually buy one on Amazon for like 15 bucks. Do you still do coffee enemas? Yeah, I regularly do them. Um, I've kind of gotten to an intuitive place with my health journey, you guys. So I think a lot of people, when you're first on this healing journey, you're like, you know, you, you're like, I need to do each thing every single day. And now it's like, I eat really healthy every single day. And then when I may be feeling like, okay, my period's coming, I'm gonna do a castor oil pack once a week, the next couple weeks, I'm gonna support detoxification. If I'm like getting headaches regularly, I know, okay, I'm, you know, I'm not detoxifying well, I need to do a coffee enema. Like I just kind of do it intuitively now. I try to do them at least once a week. Sometimes it just happens to be once every two weeks. Um, but yeah, I absolutely do coffee enemas regularly. They're a part of my, um, my wellness package. I think that every woman should, uh, utilize them. Not, you don't have to use, utilize them regularly, but it's good to have in your health and wellness arsenal. And it's also good to have an enema kit for when you really are constipated and you need to just get that junk out of you quickly and you could just do a plain water enema. It is so damaging to be constipated, you guys, when you have hormonal imbalances because remember that that's the way that estrogen gets out of the body and if you're not having a bowel movement, estrogen cannot get out and it's going to be reabsorbed and that's what ends up causing like super bad PMS and acne and things like that. So my first goal for my clients is you need to be pooping at least once a day. And I'm talking at least once a day. And if you're not, that is the ultimate goal first before we do anything else. Is there a specific Trafala brand you recommend? I am so happy you have hit 10K now. I am so happy and you deserve it. Oh, thank you. I can't wait to use my swipe up feature after I'm done with the live. I'm gonna swipe you guys up to my YouTube channel so you can go watch these lives that are now up. <laughs> um, but um, I like for Trafala, um, I think it's called Organic India brand. And um, also Organic Olivia's Keep It Moving supplement has both Cascara, Sagrada, and Trafala. So if you're like looking to get things moving and then also kind of heal the tone of the bowel which like the muscular tone um her supplement is really good because it has both of those uh big kahunas which is cascara sagrada and trifala which really help for uh constipation 
Hi, when you speak of high fibrous food greens, do you mean raw greens or cooked greens? Um, raw greens. So I think that when you have SIBO or any gut issues, really, I mean, take, I just always tell people like this analogy, take a raw bunch of kale and start rubbing it against your skin like this and just see if that's irritated. And you're gonna find that yes, it is irritated. And remember that your gut lining is skin. It's just a 10 times more sensitive to, than the skin on your arm. And so if you take a raw green and rub it on your arm and it irritates it, can you imagine what's happening inside of your body? And then imagine scraping things that are irritating on top of that already scraped skin. That's absolutely gonna affect you. Sometimes even cooked greens can be uh, too, too much, but cooked greens are a heck of a lot better than raw greens when you are having digestive troubles. And uh, the funniest thing to me is like nowadays they're people are placing so much emphasis on these leafy green vegetables and and cruciferous vegetables like they're telling people to eat like multiple servings per day and I'm just like and people are getting worse their guts are getting worse and worse and I don't see people's guts getting better honestly you guys I see them getting worse like they're down these like health rabbit holes where they're restricted all these inflammatory foods and all they're eating is pretty much like bunny food and you know meat if that and their guts are worse than they've ever been <laughs> and I'm like hmm I wonder why maybe it's the fact that you're like eating like the, all this roughage and you're not giving your body anything it needs to heal um so you know greens are not necessarily the healthiest food on the planet like people um have led you to believe salads are definitely not the healthiest food on the planet i'm not saying they're bad i'm just saying they can be very difficult to digest you are not a cow you are not a chicken you are not a sheep you are not a goat you are a human and so um, that can make it very hard for you to digest greens. So um, when your gut is irritated, you actually wanna do very soothing foods. If you weren't, if your gut has been irritated your whole life, you need to go back to when you were a baby and feed yourself as if you were a little tiny baby. Go back to your baby food days. Oops, sorry. Um, can you speak to breaking up scar tissue near the perineum following giving birth? Causes some discomfort during intercourse with an already shot libido. It's very discouraging. Um, did you get an episiotomy? Um, I always recommend women try to, you know, just for your, if you got an episiotomy um, for your next birth, remember that, and, and this is not me, t I, I think that a birth is a, a, is a very personal thing. A woman can do birth however she wants to do it. Um, but I do like to educate women. And uh, what you have to understand is when you, if you get induced with Pitocin, which is an artificial oxytocin, it makes your contractions come harder and faster, right? So here you are contracting harder than your body would naturally contract. And then what happens is you are gonna scream for that epidural, right? You're like, I need that epidural and I need it now because you need to be numb. You can't handle these artificial contractions. Contractions. It's not what your body was meant to handle, and so you therefore can't handle it. And so you ask for the epidural, you're now numb from the waist down. And so what happens is you cannot, so as a woman, you're, you're supposed to feel the contraction because when you feel that contraction, you can push with the contraction and the skin actually stretches with the contraction and then lowers without the contraction. And so when we have an epidural, we can't feel the contraction. And so sometimes we'll, we'll, we, ha we push when we're not actually contracting. The doctors don't know this. They just say, push, push. And they have to cut you because you're not pushing with your body. A lot of times women don't realize that it's better to tear than it is to be cut because you your skin would tear and then it would heal properly because it, it tore the way it would like to tear. You know, your your skin never tears in a straight line like a slice. Your your skin tears um, on its own in a, in a very uh, organic pattern so it could better heal itself. And so remember, like, I just teach you guys that the, the body is so wise and when we start to really mess with it, we can, we can really... Um, affect the way that it heals. But that is a long story to say that if you got an episiotomy and things were cut, it, um, it, it heals wrong. It doesn't heal very well. Um, so what I would do is I would apply maybe some olive oil to start softening up the, the tissue there. Um, you would just want to maybe start, you would want to just massage. Scar tissue is best to massage, but you you need to make sure it's been uh, it's healed so you know three months or so after it's actually happened I'm, I'm 
uh, I'm assuming you're you're healed up it's just the scar tissue and so just you know ask hubby for a massage you need to just massage the area maybe warm up the olive oil a little bit I would do extra virgin olive oil Costco's olive oil is true olive oil and just rub the skin and just maybe work on it not too much because you don't want to inflame it or irritate it but I would just work on it and that's what I would do if I was in that situation and I'm so sorry I know it's so frustrating um, because you're already like my libido is shot because of hormones and then it's already uncomfortable down there also some things other things you could do is invest in a squatty potty or at least put some stacks of books underneath your feet when you go to the bathroom uh, to keep yourself in that natural position because a lot of women don't realize that when you're in a seated position on the toilet you're straining your pelvic floor muscles to get a bowel movement out and so when you lift up your feet and you're actually in a squatting position you're you're able to pass a bowel movement without strenuous anything straining and so that can further you know cause irritation in the area so overall I would just be patient with it give yourself some grace do just some gentle massage get some olive oil in it to soften the skin um, or some beef tallow or ghee is also a wonderful um, massage oil and um, just give it some time it it, it it I would just use manual massage to do that Will your program help to understand SIBO and so on? Um, not fully nourished, but um, my my next program, the gut program, is going to be a lot more um, focused on like SIBO and candida and yeast and um, bacteria and things like that. What about bananas? I love to make banana ice cream, but afraid it's too much sugar. Ah, not the sugar from bananas. Oh my gosh. Dude, just make some nice cream. Are, are you kidding me? Um, what I like to do is I make some make nice cream, and then I will make some coconut oil. I'll, I'll melt some coconut oil, mix in some cacao powder, and then pour it over the top so it freezes. And then you just combine some uh, sugar with um, fat, and so it kind of slows the absorption. And then you can add collagen to the nice cream to slow the absorption. The deal is it's not necessarily that carbs and sugar are bad or good. It's all about what they're combined with. That is really the answer to the question. I hate when people demonize a specific food. I almost always can figure out a way to allow someone to eat a food without it really affecting their blood sugar. Just add some protein in the form of collagen or gelatin, because gelatin would really thicken it up, and then just add some coconut oil uh, chocolate to make like a turtle shell, like a hard cracking turtle shell on top. And th there you just add protein and fat to that situation. Could a ganglion cyst and UTIs be connected to PCOS? UTIs are connected to gut bacteria, absolutely. Is original cinnamon okay, or should we only eat Ceylon cinnamon? I love original cinnamon. Um, original cinnamon, or I think you're just referring to like cassia cinnamon, is usually contaminated with like super inflammatory um, like bark. A lot of times they, it's not pure cinnamon, it's like wood mixed in. <laughs> so I would recommend sticking to Ceylon cinnamon. It's way less irritating. It just causes less allergic reaction. Hey, how can I deal with high prolactin? Get your stress levels down. Eat regularly. Eat enough nutrients. Make sure you're not in a stressful situation and environment. Get your chem chemicals out of your life, and you'll watch your prolactin really improve. Any idea what stabbing pain behind the right bottom rib cage is when you take a deep breath? Um, no, I would definitely get that checked out, but if it's right here, like under that rib cage, that is your gallbladder. And um, a lot of times if you have estrogen dominance or not enough progesterone, the bile can get really thick and viscous and kind of just like, ugh. And um, it can really cause problems. It can actually kind of like jam up the gallbladder. So uh, I do like castor oil packs for helping with gallbladder pain. I used to have gallbladder pain all the time and castor oil packs really do um they it dilates the the gallbladder pathways in order to let bile flow out a lot quicker and then you can kind of start moving things along but remember that hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes are needed in the stomach in order to get your gallbladder to secrete bile properly if that's not happening if your digestion is impaired and all of that food is dropping into the small intestine without hydrochloric acid or digestive enzymes then the gallbladder won't secrete bile properly and there you'll just have like old bile just sticking around in the gallbladder are there any best fruits you would suggest while transitioning off keto while not upset upsetting the gut too much i would stick to like less fibrous um vegetables or fruits so like papaya mango um uh, like maybe a little bit of banana um just like really easy to digest um and then sticking 
staying a little bit farther away from like very pectin rich fruits like apples pears even stone fruits might be okay for you like a ripe peach or a ripe nectarine or a ripe plum something like that but if they're not ripe they're gonna just irritate you but I would stick to ones that are like really easy to digest oranges and citrus are specifically um, easier to digest any tips in helping the bowel and the motility to move? Yeah, so ginger tea is very wonderful for gut motility and just overall like not eating things that are going to, excuse me, um, not going to um, irritate your digestive tract or slow everything down. Um, like I said, really fiber rich foods are gonna slow everything down. I'm insulin resistant, have very regular periods, severe hirsutism, high testosterone, and I'm about 87 kilograms at a height of about 5'5". Thyroid hormone readings appear to be okay. Um, whenever somebody says thyroid readings appear to be okay, that always like asks a question in my mind, like, are you sure? Um, but the best way to tell if your metabolism is suboptimally functioning is taking your temperatures in the morning and uh, taking your temperature 40 minutes after breakfast to see where they're at. If they're regularly below 97.8, you know your thyroid function is suboptimal, whether that's due to stress hormones su suppressing thyroid function or um, uh, some other factors. But if you're insulin resistant, um, it's very important to focus on liver health. It's very important to make sure that you're... Um, you're eating regular balanced meals. You know, four to five meals every two to three hours with protein, carb, and fat. That's really the only way uh, that we can get our blood sugar balanced. And then when it comes to insulin resistance, you really wanna be concerned with the types of fats you're eating. It's so important to focus mostly on saturated fats, like from dairy, um, meat, ghee, grass-fed butter, um, beef tallow, that kind of thing, and really staying away from too many polyunsaturated fats, specifically from industrial seed oils like canola, soybean, that kind of thing. But excessive consumption of like nuts even can really uh, play, put a damp wet cloth on your metabolism. So I'm not saying be nut afraid, but a lot of people are like, when people tell them to eat protein, carbon, fat, they only eat plant fats, and that's not good for a, me a metabolic function. You really wanna be focusing on like coconut oil, ghee, grass-fed butter if you want a fast metabolism that's where it's at what would someone do for high adrenaline and how much uh how would i know i've got high adrenaline um you can kind of tell if you have high adrenaline just high stress hormones high blood glucose reading in the morning while fasting um your pulse is fast so you take your you know that's why i recommend pulsing um taking your pulse so you know how fast your pulse is um you, you would you would see signs of stress hormones, um, hirsutism, um, uh, you know, anxiety, racing heart, all signs of stress. And uh, the best way you can do that is lowering stress on the body. And how do you lower stress on the body? Well, you give it what it's asking for, what it needs. And a lot of times it needs more food. A lot of women aren't eating enough, less exercise, more sunlight. That's a huge one that women don't understand that lack of sunlight is a stressor in itself. That is a metabolic stressor to not get enough sunlight. You know, all this sun fear, I'm just like, you're literally exchanging your life for a wrinkle. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I'll take the wrinkle, thank you very much. Like, are you kidding me? So, um, getting enough sun, um, being in a positive environment, and just eating regular balanced meals every two to three hours, protein, carbon, fat, really focus on saturated fats and get some sugar in your diet. Like, holy crap, people are just so afraid of sugar and all the clients that come to me with anxiety and who are on low carb diets, I immediately have them start drinking orange juice, um, fresh squeezed orange juice with breakfast and dinner because um, they need some, sh some quick absorbing sugars. What should be a pre-workout and post-workout snack for PCOS? Um, you know, it doesn't really matter. I would just, again, protein, carbon, fat. I just have like your regular meals. So for example, like Greek yogurt and some fruit or um, just some bone broth mixed with coconut oil or like gelatin gummies that you made with gelatin and fruit juice, like just like a regular snack um, or just like your regular meal. You don't need anything special pre-workout or post-workout. I'm not sure what the root cause could be and I'm not sure how I can find out. Are there any other tests I can undergo? I wouldn't, you guys, like tests are one of those things where 
it's time there does come a point where you've done all the testing you can do and now you just got to put it into action you've got to start eating protein carbs and fat balanced meals you've got to remove infl inflammatory foods you've got to lower stress on the body you've got to get more sunlight you've got to get more enjoyment in your life do more things for fun you've got to you know cut off ties with that really toxic friend that makes you feel like crap about yourself every time you see her you know like there does come a point where you've done all the testing you can do and now it's time to start putting it into work and doing the work and it's so much easier to run testing than to face the fact that it's time to start making changes you got to start moving daily you got to get outside daily um, you've got to uh, deal with you know if there's been some issues in your life like trauma wise you got to get to the bottom of that you know there's there does come a point where you've just got to start removing stressors and working on yourself and it takes time thoughts on anti-malarian hormone um you know I don't really think it's I, I know like it's important to test and it's high, but like I've just seen anti-malarian hormone improve when your overall health improves. So there does come a point where it's like, what does this hormone mean? What does this hormone mean? And I'm like, there does come a point where your hormones are imbalanced because your body's just imbalance. There's too much stress. You're not getting enough food or the right kinds of food, not getting enough nutrients. Your liver's stressed out. You know, like the basic things that um, sometimes we forget so much about the basic things. We start going crazy with like testing all this and testing all this. And I'm like, it's time to just get to the bottom of where your stress is at and removing those stressors. How can you tell if estrogen really is being stored in the tissue if only no low estrogen from the blood test? Um, you know, the best thing is to get your progesterone levels up to snuff and then see what happens to your estrogen levels. I always say get your progesterone levels up and then see if your estrogen gets higher because a lot of times remember progesterone is needed to get estrogen out of the tissues and so if you have low progesterone you you sometimes do have low estrogen um and it actually gets it out of the tissues but sometimes it could just be low estrogen across the board if you're not cycling then you might just have low estrogen um but you know like sometimes doctors will recommend supplementing with estrogen and that's where i just get so like nervous because it does um it can be inflammatory really quickly. It can go from a good thing to an inflammatory thing very quickly. But yeah, I mean, it, there's no way of really knowing if you have estrogen in the tissues or if you're just low estrogen. The only thing you could do is start improving your health and working on your thyroid function and, um, and then just see where your estrogen levels go from there. Uh, I need face sunscreen suggestions. Um, just look for like a mineral-based, zinc-based uh, uh, sunscreen. Um, I use one called, I barely use sunscreen. Um, I'm trying to think of what it's called. God, oh yeah, it's called Derma E, and I bought it at Sprouts like a long time ago, and I sometimes put it on. Um, I know Beauty Counter also has like a BB cream that has SPF in it, which I've used a couple times. So um, Beauty Counter has some good face sunscreens, I know. How do you know if you have SIBO? Um, you have really slow motility. You're either struggling with diarrhea or constipation. You have IBS. Um, you have rosacea or keratosis pilaris or acne. Um, you have estrogen dominance. Um, you have hypothyroidism. Um, you, yeah, that's, that's really it. You get really bloated after meals. Um, you can't digest food well. You see undigested uh, food in your stool, that kind of thing. Can you make a post on warming and nutrient-dense foods that you like to eat? Yeah, sure. Um, roots and fruits, you guys, first of all. Roots and fruits. Um, for protein, it's all animals. I do not eat any plant proteins because they cool me down. They slow me down. They bloat me up. Um, so I do lots of grass-fed beef, um, sometimes some pastured chicken, um, cod, shellfish, um, sometimes I'll have like some sardines, oysters. Um, I do lots of bone broth and I do lots of dairy. So, um, like, uh, organic Greek yogurt. I'll do some cottage cheese here and there. Um, I'll just have some cheese. I drink raw milk. Um, and I do lots of collagen and gelatin for protein. And then for fats, I just add like ghee and coconut oil and coconut butter and grass fed butter and, uh, ice cream. 
mm, I do ice cream every single night. Um, but yeah, that's that's really it. I try to stay away from, oh, I love mushrooms, I love carrots, um, beets, things like that. I try to stay away from too many cruciferous vegetables or leafy greens because I don't digest them well. And uh, they actually make me feel more bloated and uh, more just like blah. When I find, when I don't eat uh, very much like vegetables like that, I feel a lot better just overall as a person. Do you think androgenic alopecia can be healed? Um, I wouldn't look at it as more like healed. I would look at it more as like you got to get it stopped and then um, to restore the hair follicles. Hair fo follicles are like little mini organs. They have very high nutrient needs, very high energy needs. And so um, it's not so much as getting that healed, but getting your body the hormones and the nutrients it needs to actually grow hair properly. And that takes tons of progesterone and takes tons of thyroid, specifically T3 hormone. And so your liver needs to be optimally functioning because the thyroid makes T4, which is inactive, and then sends it to the liver and the gut to be converted to T3, which actually is the active form of thyroid hormone, which metabolizes in the cells. And then your hair follicles need adequate protein and glucose um, and saturated fats. So, you know, overall, like hair growth is, and, and restoring the hair follicle does take time and it takes a lot of work, but it can be done. All natural with a midwife, no episiotomy, just slight tear as his head and shoulder were delivered with push one due to wrapped umbilical cord. Oh, yeah. Whenever, you know, they come out with their uh, their shoulders or something, that, that leads to it. But I'm glad you had a natural birth. I would definitely utilize the olive oil. Can things like cystic acne, headaches, and sore breasts be related to estrogen dominance, or is it testosterone? Oh, girl, that is all estrogen. You can thank your, your good friend Esty for that. What to do to deal with acanthonigrations? I'm not really sure what that is. Um, could you, I, I, as a, <laughs> opposed to what you guys think, I don't know everything, and there are certain conditions that I've truly never heard of. So could you tell me what that is? I guess you told me what I needed to hear. Start implementing things. Appreciate you being generous with your time and expertise. I appreciate you guys for taking your time to be here. Is PCOS an estrogen deficiency or estrogen dominant condition? I have no periods due to PCOS. Um, I think that it has a lot to do with estrogen dominance in the tissues, honestly, um, from what I've, I'm actually reading and inflammation and thyroid issues. So when it comes to loss of a period, I always look, uh, have clients look to the thyroid first and then, um, we also go to nutrients. Is there a lack of nutrients there? Specifically B vitamins, proteins. Um, most women with PCOS are not getting enough protein because they're not digesting and absorbing it properly. So a lot of women have been told that they can get, you know, equal amounts of proteins from both plant foods and animal foods. And I'm like, that's not true. So here they are eating a bunch of plant proteins and then they can't even digest and absorb them. And so they're just protein deficient. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, that can be with a loss of a period, but I usually look to thyroid, stress hormones, and then lack of specific nutrients, specifically B vitamins, glucose, and protein. Thoughts on placenta encapsulation? So you have to remember that when you ovulate, your egg sac that drops the egg becomes the corpus luteum, which produces you progesterone for 12 to 14 days from when you ovulate all the way up until your next period. But obviously, if, if, if an egg gets fertilized then, then that corpus luteum actually turns into the placenta. And so uh, the placenta is what creates you progesterone your whole pregnancy. And so I think a lot of women that are, um, that see benefit from taking a placenta after or taking their placenta after birth it's because of the progesterone that's what i believe um and a lot of women will do like bioidentical progesterone therapy after we after a pregnancy to prevent per, uh to postpartum depression and it seems to help a lot so i think it's a, a very personal thing um there are other people that say that placenta encapsulation is not healthy because that's where a lot of toxins are stored i'm not sure what i believe about that like i know the umbilical cord is where a lot of toxins are stored because that's like how the body prevents things from getting to the baby but um, I'm not sure if I, I haven't looked into it enough to know if i would do it or not personally but i think it can have benefits and a lot of women um do find benefits from it. So I, I think that it has a lot to do with progesterone, but I need to look into that more to understand it a little more. In a past, you recommend lots of spinach and smoothies. Do you think smoothies are too cooling for the first meal? Um, yeah, I, I did recommend them in the past and I always, well, at least I tried to recommend that, um, raw, 
raw greens, raw greens be steamed first and then frozen. So when you put them into a smoothie, they are still cooked. But I think that smoothies are great for the summertime and when it's warm, And but sometimes in the winter it can be a little bit, um, cold, I think, too cold. So it just really depends. Um, you know, it just really depends. I got my gallbladder removed 12 years ago. I'm 36 now. What would you advise? Um, I would look into ox bile supplementation maybe and um, that's really it. Like I wouldn't worry too much about it. But you want to make sure that you have um, adequate amount of bile to break down fats in the small intestine. If super high B vitamins and blood result, could it be true B vitamin deficiency then related to thyroid issues? Yeah, it could be a conversion issue. It could be a methylation issue. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure. Will keto diet cause gallbladder stones? Um, it can, um, because just so much fat, especially if you have impaired gallbladder. Should we have to eat every two hours for PCOS? Um, if you have a problem with balancing blood sugar and insulin resistance, then I would really recommend eating regularly. It can really lower stress hormones. But Instagram is cutting me off, you guys. Thanks so much for spending Friday morning with me. I will be linking um, all of these lives on YouTube. I'll be uploading this onto YouTube right now. And then, um, yeah, so just make sure to watch this for the next 24 hours, and then it will be on the YouTube channel.